I found out this is being recorded, probably about five minutes after I walked in here, completely blew my presentation because I'm actually pretty controversial and, and have some pretty radical things to say. I have a couple of um, disclaimers. Um, so I am not, I guess I've been an educator for the last four years, but only as an adjunct faculty um, at Houston Community College. But I come from a line of educators. And my mother is the principal at the Navy High School. Okay? And so she has been um, in education since the 70s. So I have a, an opinion, and a biased opinion, about um, education and educators and things that I've seen actually being an adjunct faculty at Houston Community College. Because I'm also a product of Houston Community College. And so having been a student there in the 80s and then now teaching there, I'm like, were we like this back in the 80s and things changed? Um, so anyway, um, I've got a lot of things out on the table. Compliments of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, Society of Petroleum Engineers, and also I've got some goodies for people to ask me questions from the Society of Women Engineers. In addition, um, I've got some information that I think we're going to email out about scholarships with Society of Women Engineers. And so when I was asked to, to give the speech, I thought, okay, well, what, what should I talk about, given that I knew I was going to say who my mother was, and that would, she's, I've spoken quite a bit, and she said, you better not say anything to embarrass me. So, and then I found this being recorded. I we thought, don't okay. have to post the video, and it can be edited by our communications manager. <laughs> Wouldn't be the no, first time. I'm, I'm just kidding. So um, hopefully I, um, I won't embarrass my mom, nor myself, since this is going to be now forever on the, the World Wide Web. So, so thank you everyone, and another thing, I tend to talk forever, and I'm glad I've got a, a clock there, so please just start waving, jumping up and down, or saying, Jennifer, shut up, you know, whatever you guys need to do. <clears throat> so, first I want to say thank you to everyone, so instead of saying thank you at the end, and the reason being, um, and, and may I'm sure many of you guys have um, kids of your own, um, I was a pretty bad kid, okay? So you know, here's the principal at the Bakey High School. Um, and when I look back, my mother really influenced me. But if it were for the educators in my life, and I'm going to talk about that because it goes as far back as the second grade, um, as up to my high school computer science teacher, who I actually have recently set up an endowed scholarship at Texas Tech University. That's where I attended my undergrad. So if anyone knows anyone interested in going to Texas Tech, I actually have a scholarship now in the name of my computer science teacher. Because trust me, I was a bad kid, really bad in high school. Um, and so sometimes I wonder, wow, I'm really glad I had the teachers I had, the parents I had, because uh, I would not be here today. So I just want to thank you guys, because you have, the reason why I sent the Endowed Scholarship, actually, is because my mother in the last couple of years says, you're always talking about your computer science teacher. You should reach out to her and, and tell her how influential you were. So I actually did reach out to her. Of course she didn't remember me because that was in 1986. Um, and, but we actually met and I told her about the scholarship. We wrote up the requirements um, together. It's one of the best things that, that I've ever done. And she said that I'm the first student that's actually come back to her and tell her. And I thought, oh my gosh, this woman's been teaching for 40 years and I'm the first one. And I said, Ms. McKay, I'm sure that there's a whole bunch more of me running around. I don't know how many endowed scholarships you may have in your name, but trust me, there's a whole bunch of people like me running around. So I just want to say thank you to everyone for being an educator. Um, and I know that community college is not quite the same, but I, I, I do get it um, now giving back in the classroom in a very different way. So a couple of things that I do want to talk about, and I want to show you guys a video from Society of Women Engineers. When I think about some of my, my pivot points um, to where I, I got in, in my career, um, probably started off in, in second grade. And I will just say, um, it was just really the, the teacher, there was nothing really that, that stands out. I can tell you guys a lot about Ms. McKay that I did the endowed scholarship. But it was in second grade where I just really think I was probably really aware that the teacher cared about me. I think in kindergarten and first grade, Everybody cares about you, right? Because you're just so young, everybody cares about you. But when I was in second grade, I really realized, looking back, oh yeah, okay, so Ms. Nugent really was trying to, to help me. And I think, I was actually having a conversation at the table, I actually probably had multiple learning disabilities that we didn't diagnose in the 70s and, and 80s. And I, I'm still dyslexic to this day. And so I remember having a hard time dealing with cursive and writing and stuff. And I do remember my second grade teacher just encouraging me um, you know, to, to, and my handwriting is still actually horrible to this day. I don't know if dyslexia and horrible handwriting 
um, go hand in hand. But I just remember her really helping me with uh, my, my cursive and, and having really good handwriting and just really truly caring. Now what I want to mention about Junior ROTC is uh, I, in high school I, I had, um, I was a little bit of a rebel. I went to a, a private school up through 8th grade which is very small. And in high school, um, I went to Clare Creek High School, and we lived out in, um, in the district um, by the time I was six or seven. But I was so angry at my parents, I was like, I just want to ride the bus. I don't want to go to this stupid private school in Houston. I want to ride the bus and be a normal kid. Well, some of the things I guess my parents didn't think about was I went to a school where we had K through eight, about 300 kids. And then in Clare Creek at the time, in 1984, freshman class was 1,200. So it really freaked me out, going from K through 8, 300 kids to 1,200 kids. And my mother says to this day, even though she thinks I'm the most wonderful kid in the world, and she would tell everyone, oh, Jennifer's the greatest. Trust me, I was not in high school. I think having that huge jump um, was probably one of those pivotal points in, in me probably kind of going off the, I, I don't want to say reclusiveness, but just trying to figure out my own way, coming from basically a very small cultured school, a protective school, um, to go into an environment like that. So I joined Junior ROTC, um, and, and I was, I mean, I always loved math and science and things like that. Uh, more so science, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But when I, I decided that I wanted to be a physics teacher, and I knew that by the time I was in ninth grade. And when I joined Junior ROTC, we took this test called the ASVAB test, which I think some of you guys have heard of. And it said I should be a mechanical engineer. And I was like, well, what's this? I want to be a physics teacher. This is engineering stuff. Well, you know, particularly girls, even now, um, they don't tell you about engineering. You really don't know what, what engineers are. So I did a little research, and I thought, oh, I can do physics and make a whole bunch of money. Okay, yeah, I'll do this mechanical engineering thing. So that was a, kind of, for me, that was when I decided to get focused on, on engineering and, and really probably, looking back now, start disciplining myself. But I promise, I promise you, I was not disciplined throughout my four years of, of high school. I was just doing, I'm doing bad things. Um, just, you know, staying out late, and I had a job in the mall, and wouldn't do my homework, and I would skip class. Um, those are the days where I could actually write my own notes and take my mother's handwriting um, <laughs> and get away with it. I don't think you can do that anymore. And so, yes, I know that's being recorded, and Mom does know that I used to fake my absences all the time. And, and I would just sleep in and watch MTV, so I mean, it wasn't really bad. But, but MTV, we actually had videos, right? Um, but when I look back, um, I'm going to talk about how technical and professional societies have really helped me upon graduating from, from Texas Tech. But the ones that I think have really been pivotal for me are the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, Society of Women Engineers, and Society of Petroleum Engineers. I've had 20 years in the energy um, industry. The last five years, I've, I've kind of, um, I guess, expanded my work um, outside of energy. But in general, I've had a career in energy. So what I'd like to do is take some time and show you guys the Society of Women Engineers video. There's a ton of resources here, um, and so you can go to either SWE.org or this is the Houston website. Did, I didn't ask, do we have volume? Because if we don't, sure. the video is not going <clears> to <throat> be any good for us. I see it's, looks like it's up here. Houston, the home of NASA's Johnson Space Center home to 23 Fortune 500 companies and counting, and more than 10,000 manufacturing establishments. Known as the oil and gas capital of the world, it's no wonder the Society of Women Engineers chartered a section in Houston. Founded in 1979, the Society of Women Engineers Houston Area Section is a non-profit corporation. We provide education resources for promoting science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, also known as STEM, for women in the greater Houston area. We empower women of all ages and diverse cultures to successfully achieve their aspirations. We recognize women for their contributions as leaders in the community. We offer professional development programming, networking opportunities, mentoring for current and future leaders, and business opportunities for large and small organizations. We support K-12 STEM programming for female students. We offer scholarships, camperships, and awards encouraging young women to engage in the sciences. We 
are a volunteer resource for both parents and STEM educators. The Society of Women Engineers, Houston Area Section, an organization that is proud for developing women engineers at all stages of their personal and professional lives. So how many of you knew about the Society of Women Engineers prior, prior to this presentation? So I want to tell you guys, we are a wealth of resource of volunteers for you. So if you're looking for anyone to come in to talk to your um, students, um, get involved um, in various different camps or just bounce ideas off of or, or just need some help, um, there's a lot of resources for you. And I'm going to have some information emailed to you. I will not be the contact of Society of Women Engineers. Um, I was the president in 2004, but I have since kind of done other things. And so we now have officers that um, can help you guys. But I do have my cards on the table. So you guys can also email me if you just need to know who the resources are. But I, I will not be your main point of contact for the Society of Women of Engineers. Um, just a little bit uh, about me very quickly. So this is me over here. Um, this is my first job working offshore um, in Canada, and I'm all bundled up. I think this is about three or four days before um, Christmas in 1997. And just some things that I, I just want to share with you guys. So, you know, I really have no idea, um, you know, the different factors of, of why I behaved the way I did in, in high school. Like I said, I had some thoughts. But I will tell you guys, no matter what, I never really liked math. And so one of my pet peeves is, is that, oh, you've got to be great in math and science um, to, to be a really good engineer. Well, I'm going to tell you guys, you don't have to be great in math to be a good engineer, but you definitely have to tackle it and accomplish it. Um, so it's kind of like... Um, Maybe um, exercising three or four times a week or, or eating, um, you know, healthy foods, fruits and vegetables and things like that. Math is okay for me, but I don't, if I could, I would never look at math ever, ever again. Which I know sounds probably counter um, to what you guys may think about engineers. One of the things I want to share with you guys is trying to, to figure out the students that are maybe the 3.0 students and not the 4.0 students. Because I definitely was not a 4.0 student in high school. Now, maybe I would have been had I gone to a different high school, stayed in that sheltered environment, or maybe I just would have been a rebel and watched on TV at home anyway. Who knows? Um, but um, I definitely was not a, a 4.0 um, type of student once I got to high school. I was through eighth grade, but not in, in high school. And the, the people I had to look up to, one of the reasons why I continue to do these talks, and my first talk was actually at um, Texas A&M back in the late 90s. <laughs> my little sister, who also, she attended Debakey High School, I did not, um, but she went to A&M, and she's also a, an engineer. She did it purely for the money. Forget the ASVAB, forget the one at Debakey. She, was, she knew how much money I was making. She was like, I'm going to be an engineer, too. Um, and she had the grades to do it. She actually got scholarships. I didn't get any scholarships um, out of high school, so she's a smart cookie. But she asked me to go talk to these aspiring engineers, and uh, several things. One, they were asking me about who were the women that inspired me. And I was like, well, there weren't no women that inspired me. I, well, basically, when I was a little kid, I wanted to be Mr. Spock. And I wanted to be a Star Trek Enterprise. And even though I thought Lieutenant Aurora was cool, I wasn't interested in communications. I was interested in all the cool things that Mr. Spock was saying. And then as I got into high school, which is why I absolutely love physics, um, I just absolutely love Dr. Hawking. And so those are the people that I wanted to be when, when I grew up. Um, but because also, I, these got, you know, obviously Mr. Spock is a fictitious character, but they were both really, really good at math. Um, and, and so I probably would, could never be either of them, even if I really wanted to. Um, due to the time, um, I'm going to go around, and we have a networking session, because I want to get a little bit um, from, from everyone, because I want to know really some of the things that you guys are, are looking for um, to help with your um, potential future engineers and scientists. So let me just skip on through the rest of the slides, and then maybe we can come back to that. So I already told you guys that I was a, you know, a pretty bad kid and stayed at home and watched MTV, despite myself I actually had a pretty decent GPA, and, and Clear Creek was... Um, I took all, all AP science classes, so just so you guys know, I wanted to be in the AP science classes, but I just took the regular math classes. Um, but just to give you guys some context, this is uh, me after getting my MBA with my little sister, and she gets so mad, because she's 36, but in my mind she's always 10. Um, so that's my little sister, this is my mom and, and me, and we're actually at a wedding at one of her um, students up in, in Dallas. 
Um, and then this is just another really good friend here who's also a mechanical engineer that had graduated from the University of Houston. And so what I really, kind of some things I want to share with you guys, so this is totally scientific because it's based on me and all my friends. So you're drawn to who you're drawn to, right? So if I ask all of my girlfriends who are engineers or scientists, um, things that basically, forget the whole academic thing, does the student have a 4.0, are they really testing high, things like that. I don't remember taking any test in high school other than the SAT and the ACT. If we took tests, I, I don't remember. I know been was teaching back in the 80s, but I don't think we had these tests. Um, and so I was trying to figure out, well, how do you know a future engineer scientist, regardless of their test scores or regardless of their GPA? Well, <coughs> one I asked, um, four years ago, I left my corporate job at, at Chevron to, to take a sabbatical and do some entrepreneurial type of things. My parents thought I'd completely lost my mind, even though I had the money saved and was completely compared, prepared to do it. So I said, okay, well, Dad, tell me what I'm really supposed to do if you don't think that, you know, I'm not making the right career path. And he actually said, well, you know, by the time you were two or three, you would follow me around with my tools and want to fix things. I'm like, okay, well, and I actually took a, a test. I take it about every year or so, just confirming I should be an engineer. Um, and I took one of those online tests that are free, and it said, actually, this time it said I should be a chemical engineer. And I thought, well, maybe that sabbatical has kind of warped me, because I, I've usually always tested for a mechanical engineer or something in, in physics. Um, never stops talking. And what I mean by that is I realized one of the things that I should have put on there of the influencers, even though she was not an engineer, I absolutely loved Wonder Woman, i.e. Linda Carter, because I grew up in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And I remember I, whenever, whether it be watching Star Trek or Wonder Woman, I'd always be asking just the craziest questions like, well, how did they do that? How did they build her invisible plane? How is she able to talk? How? And so I don't really know what's out there, what kids look like, um, look at now that's the equivalent to, to Star Trek or, or Wonder Woman. But um, I also, my parents say I never stopped talking, and I still usually don't ever stop talking. And like I said, I asked a lot of questions about things that seemed far-fetched as a child. And my computer science teacher, even though she didn't remember, I would um, tell her some of the things that I would talk about in class. And actually, one of the, the software models that I did was modeling a greenhouse on the moon. Um, and, and so I, was, I remember just being just curious about some of the, the craziest um, stuff. Um, also, I think, in, in general, maybe this is a general, uh, generational thing, because I am a, a Gen X. But really happy to work alone or with little supervision. And I think even you see, even with smaller kids, uh, my sister has two boys, and her oldest is 12. And even though he's, you know, in a completely different generation, he can just play by himself um, for hours and, and just read books and, and work with things. And he actually thinks he wants to be an architect. Well, her baby, who is 10, um, can't stand being alone. He's like super hyper, and he either wants to be a rapper <laughs> um, or something with music. And so maybe there is something about the happy to working with loan and just being um, curious about things. Um, now, again, I just want to uh, emphasize, doesn't care for the math, but I really want to tell you guys, I love geometry and trigonometry. Okay, so even though that falls under math, I actually can't stand calculus and differential equations and stuff that's just so abstract. It makes absolutely no sense, even though I need it, we know, I know we need it to model basically everything we do as engineers and scientists. But for me, geometry and trend, I can see that. That like, makes total sense um, to me. So again, I'm trying to give you guys a target for not those students that are excelling, but, you know, the 3.0 is like a horrible thing, which I just think, man, I could just be like a, you know, a or really, you know, like a kid that basically was never going to go anywhere. It just drives me crazy that um, the way the education system now is that we're so focused on grades and how students are going to succeed that it, I've just realized there's an untapped market because there's all these kids like me that aren't going to have a 4.0 for, for whatever reason um, that probably can be very successful engineers, scientists, or engineer technologists. And maybe they don't have to go to the greatest schools, or maybe they're only going to go to a two-year school. But I really think that it's important to figure out how we can work on that, that what I call that untapped market. Um, so I'm just going to let you guys read this. I actually spoke at Emory Riddle a couple years ago, and I saw this little thing 
um, on one of their labs. So I just took a picture of that because for me that just completely wraps it up. Um, if you want to observe an engineer in her natural habitat, just watch what they do and you will actually find um, in your classroom, you will find engineers. And I even argue that you guys will find engineers that are making probably half of their grades or C's. Okay, I mean a lot of it is, is they maybe didn't have the fundamentals of the math and the science that they needed. But there are a lot of engineers, and I always remind everyone of the, you know, the biggest dropouts, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, and, you know, Elon Musk, you know, and I'm certainly not like them. And they were probably dropouts when they were so bored at their schools, um, you know, and, and university. Um, but even if, you know, we don't want anyone to drop out of high school, but I think that there's still a lot of untapped potential. And whether it's they didn't have the foundation or they're just totally and completely bored, there's a reason I want you guys to look out for that. So things that I really wanted to share with you guys, these are some various different pictures of me. So I've worked for Chevron um, most of my career, and I've been very fortunate that I've worked in probably over a dozen countries and able to vacation an additional dozen more because I was already there. I've had, I've spent most of my, I should say most, but a good portion of my time actually working on construction barges and drilling rigs. So a lot of time I've spent in the ocean. So I may, I mean, I've been to Argentina, and that sounds really exotic, but 99% of my time um, was in the ocean, um, in Tierra del Fuego, so that's, you know, not as exotic on a construction bar as it is in Buenos Aires, you know. Um, but I have been able to see quite a few things. And so just some pictures here of various different things. This here on the, the right, um, just this last October in Philadelphia, I was on a panel, we hear this buzzword of, big data and data analytics. Well, I was very fortunate to be on a panel. Um, this lady is with Intel, she's with IBM, that's me. This lady's with AT&T, this lady's with Toyota. And this is a PhD candidate from a and in, I think, bioinformatics something. Um, I know I'm going to mess it up, but basically it's with biosciences. And so you never know also, one of the great things when I go talk to, to young students, even college students, I was not active in Society of Women Engineers when I was in college. And I really thought, well, who needs that? We're all just engineers. Despite the fact that at Texas Tech, when I actually attended, um, we had about 600 in the mechanical engineering department. And we may have only graduated one female engineer a semester. Ooh. So it was very obvious to me that there were not a lot of female engineers. But when, you know, at that age, I just wanted to be an engineer. We wouldn't focus on, you know, male, female, and how many men, women were in the workforce and things like that. And one of the great things for me being a part of Society of Women Engineers, see, you know, I work in the oil field. Um, none of these people work in the oil field, and they do all very, very interesting things in their career. And being belonging to a professional society allows you to meet some of the most interesting people and interesting engineers that, as a woman, look, feel, and smell like you, because they talk about schools, they talk about the problems with their kids, they talk about, you know, their husbands and, you know, not maybe bad, but it's just when you go to an American Society of Mechanical Engineers, you're not going to have those same type of conversations with your colleagues as you do when you go to Society of Women Engineers, in addition to talking about your technical and your engineering career. But so, some of the things I wanted to share with you guys are, okay, so what are the things that um, I learned in high school um, that I still do now? And I want to show you guys, I brought this book. I don't know if you guys have heard about something called the Professional Engineers License, the PE. Um, so there's two tests that you have to take in order to get your PE license in any um, state. And so you have to pass something called um, basically the Fundamentals of Engineering, which I took in college, and thank goodness I took in college, and I would fail this thing if I took now. And then you take your Professional Engineers License. So I just want, I would leave this out for you guys to flip through it, because you guys, particularly you, you science and math teachers, will recognize a lot of things. But I kid you not, you're trying to even think about what engineers do, and I broke it down to what are some of the things that I did in high school or my first year of college. Um, th this is what I do as an engineer today. Okay, so it's for you guys that are basically scientists and mathematicians, this is not like crazy, wild, hard stuff. I mean, this is what you guys do in the classroom. Um, some other things, I'll talk about these pictures. And so granted, Electrical circuits and programming logic was very different um, in the 80s and 90s than it is now. But the way you think when you program, and I hopefully there's, are you guys still teaching binary? Or do you teach binary in high school or introduce that at all, binary numbers? Okay, so just the concept of binary numbers um, 
and just programming in general, regardless of the programming language you've learned, are just critical um, thinking skills. And so even if you end up not being a computer scientist or electrical engineer, these are all just core critical thinking skills I think all scientists and engineers um, need. So one of the things I really want to show you guys that's important here is this is some equipment that I've worked on. This is a testing facility in, in England that I'll talk about because I know we're running out of time. But this picture here, um, the last couple of years of Chevron, I was drilling in South Texas, West Texas, and in the Gulf of Mexico. And this picture, for all of us that either are native Texans or have just lived in Texas long enough, um, a lot of the drilling activity goes on on farms and, and ranches. And so I, we were driving through from one of the drill sites, and I saw this solar panel, and I started screaming. And the guy in the truck was like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, get out, take a picture, i got to show this. Because, you know, by this time, I've been talking to lots of students for a long time. And so this was actually a shock for me. And like I said, this was probably five years ago, and here I am working in the energy industry. But you really now find, which I absolutely love, is you basically find the convergence of renewables and non-renewables coming together, even in the oil field. Things have actually um, really, really progressed, and, and unfortunately I don't have pictures because I haven't been out um, to love it for about four or five years. But out in West Texas, where there actually is a lot of uh, exploration going on, um, there are so many companies now that actually are using, instead of bringing diesel um, power on to um, basically the, the pad site, they're actually setting up their own wind farms and solar energy and using that to run all the operations <coughs> and selling back to the power grid. And so what you guys are going to start seeing is, yes, renewables and non-renewables are really converging and coming together. And there, I was just at a conference in, in August. It was an uh, unconventional resources <coughs> conference um, in San Antonio. And there was a panelist of CEOs talking, and they're like, yeah, this is making us money. We're doing this. Um, so whether the drivers are wrong or right, I, I just want to say that I'm really happy to say that I, we're really seeing a lot of renewables, even in the oil field. And, and so this is just a picture that I want to share. I could talk probably about this technology and, and so many other things that we're doing in renewables and oil and gas, but that's a completely different um, topic and speech. I'm going to wrap up with saying um, just a couple of things. So this is me. I, I've gone back to Texas Tech University um, quite a few times. Um, my grades weren't stellar there either, but probably because I was such a bad, if I wouldn't have been watching MTV all the time, <laughs> maybe I would have had good grades. Um, but I, I do go back, and, and I actually, I never tell them that my grades were as bad as they were. Because I'm like, what? It was your GPA like a 37? And I'm thinking, God, that would be a fantasy if I had a 37 in college. Are you kidding me? Um, so that's what they think is bad nowadays. Um, so this is me talking to some students a couple years back. This here, because of my... I guess my passion about, uh, granted, Debakey High School, we all know that all the kids there are, are, are very smart. But my mother actually allowed me to, to launch a, a camp that I actually, I needed a place to beta test it. And if it messed up, um, then it would slip out on my mom, right, and not me. Um, I'm just kidding. But I needed a place that, um, I have this camp that I've created called Talk Nerdy to Me. And so there's enough people here in the audience that know, um, I had this um, presentation that I would go do for about an hour and a half, and I called it Rollerblades, Pantyhose, and Tupperware. Okay, that means nothing to anyone in high school. Okay, and I know that I'm sure that means something to most of you guys. And I actually love Tupperware, um, but even if somebody in 12th grade knows what Tupperware is, they think it's a Ziploc bag or a Ziploc container, and, and I'm like, no, that's not Tupperware, like the real Tupperware. And so I changed this presentation um, to talk nerdy to me, and we actually did a four day camp. And what we did is um, we brought in um, engineers and scientists. I don't think anyone had anything to do with life sciences or medicine or anything like that. Because one, these kids get enough of that at DeBakey. And I just really wanted to expose them to um, the concept of leadership. And so they could actually see that there are other people um, you know, out there that were women that looked like them that were doing things. Now, I don't know the exact statistics, but basically the kids that go to DeBakey, a very small percentage of them actually end up going on to be MDs. I should say small, but not everyone does. So my sister is an example. She became an engineer. So you do have a lot of engineers. Um, you have a lot of attorneys. You have a lot of accountants. Um, so there's a lot of things they do, and they all, I think a lot of them end up going um, to not only doing undergrad, but graduate work. 
But I realized, um, not only for myself, because I wanted to be Mr. Spock, and I hope that no girl wants to be Mr. Spock <coughs> now, or at least maybe, you know, really think that, okay, one day I want to be Mr. Spock, maybe there's a, you know, a, we've progressed now, so we've got some women in science fiction movies that are pretty cool that girls can be like. But there's this lack of role models, and there's a lot of first-generation girls, um, particularly when I look within the Houston Independent School District and school districts around, that their parents never went to college. Now, I was fortunate enough that my parents did attend college, but I was the first engineer in my family. And so the things that I faced and the, and the things that I needed to bounce ideas off of and ask, um, one, my parents were baby boomers, and so they were like, shut up, put your head down, work hard, don't complain. Okay, well, that's not my generation. It certainly isn't the millennials. And if you told them that, I mean, they would have absolutely no clue of what you're, you're talking about. And so this, with this Talk Nerdy to Me camp, and um, I can talk offline because I'm planning on doing the camp again, and Society of Women Engineers paired up with me last year, and they want to pair up with me again, and we'd like to take this to maybe two or three other schools um, besides DeBakey since it actually worked and it was a success. So I'm looking for some high schools that maybe are interested um, in sponsoring this. And what I mean by sponsoring is I just need a facility. I don't need money, but I need a, a place to, to hold it. I'll figure out how we get the money out, um, like I did um, last summer. But um, I don't know if these students, these 17 year olds, will actually be working with baby boomers. They're definitely going to be working with me who are the Gen Xers. And we actually have a different work ethic um, than, than they do. And one of the things that is not taught, in, or at least it wasn't taught in college when I was in college, and I don't really think it's talked about now, is really, but I think more so for girls, who are your role models and who are people you can bounce ideas off of, who are people you can look up to and want to be aspire to, and just basically dealing with things in the workforce. And um, if we want to make all of these students, whether they have 2.0s, 3.0s, I guess you could have a 5.0 at Nebakey or whatever school that you know rating that they're on. They can be as smart as they want to be, but they. Um, I really think that we need to figure out how we start giving students, particularly. I'm first generation engineer, um, but a lot of students who are first generation anything beyond high school, the skills they need um, above and beyond just having really really good grades, because that is just so critical when these students get out in their workforce. And I will tell you guys. Good grades will get you, you know, you can write your own ticket. Even as an engineer, I'd say average grades, because we need so many engineers and scientists. But once you get in, if you don't know how to deal with, with conflict, if you don't know how to deal with these baby boomers that are workaholics, if you don't know how to deal with the Gen Xers that are independent, and even though we grew up um, with some technology, all this Facebook and Twitter and, and things like that, I'm at the age group still where it's like, walk down the hall and talk to me. Don't IM me on the computer when I'm just three doors away. And so there's a lot of things that the, the skills that these younger students need to have that you're not going to be thinking about in high school. We need to figure out a way to I expose them to those things. And so, again, I really focus on Society of Women Engineers, which, one, you don't have to be a woman to join. So all the men educators in this room can be a member of Society of Women Engineers. We actually have awards for male educators. And I do know that a lot of the male students on campus join because that's where they get to meet girls. Yeah. Um, so there's resources there, and there's also resources within ASNU. So I think I um, am about wrapped up on my time. Do I have any time for questions, or do I need to yeah. push that up and off the stage? You have time for questions. Okay. And so one of the things I guess I wanted to ask you guys that I, I left alone is I really wanted to know um, some of the things that you guys feel that engineers, you know, if you could have an engineer um, on the phone, on the hotline, or in your classroom, what are some things that you'd like to get back from them? And so this is the thing I'd like to know from you guys. If you guys have any questions for me, um, and it can be about anything, I will not tell you my GPA in high school or college. <laughs> Nobody knows that except the Texas Tech Registrar and my parents. Um, <laughs> but I'll probably answer just about anything else. So I really appreciate um, your time, and um, thanks for having me here.